This episode is a part two episode, meaning that it's a continuation of the conversation from our previous episode, part one. If you haven't listened to that, now's a great time to pause, listen to part one first, and then come back for part two. I want to go back to a piece that you had mentioned. Um, yeah, taking that pressure off of teachers, which I agree with. There's enough pressure. They should be there to teach, to do what right. they're passionate about. But do you feel like by potentially having the admin, right, do you feel like that allows them to buy in if they do have a piece of the performance as far as how the school is doing and how, you know, are we getting better? Are we growing? Do you feel like that, not that it put pre- puts pressure on them, but that that sure. does give them the buy-in piece? Yeah, I, I think so. So there, there's a, I keep going back to business references, sorry. Yeah, it's it's okay. kind, of, kind of my only frame yeah. of reference. So there's there's an old adage in business is uh, there's there's a bunch of guys laying brick and they're mm-hmm. building the 16th chapel, mm-hmm. and they asked the first guy what are you doing and he's like I'm laying brick. And they mm-hmm. asked the second guy what are you doing he goes I'm building a wall, and they asked the third guy what are you doing he goes well I'm building this beautiful chapel that's going to you know inspire people for generations. Wow. I want teachers not to be bricklayers. Right. Right. I right. want to, to see the vision. just see the big picture and see kind of how they fit into it. And generally, if people understand that they're part of something bigger than themselves mm-hmm. and they buy into the vision, they perform mm-hmm. better. Yeah. So. Absolutely. We all need to be able to know where we fit in. Right. Right. That's a, that's a huge, huge, huge. But piece. not just fit in to the in the macro mm-hmm. bit or the micro, but fit in into the macro and how my contribution really impacts the whole. Mm-hmm. Right. It can, th- my contribution is still really, really important, but I need right. to be able to come out of the weeds every now and then and look around and say, oh, wow, I'm making a difference. Right. 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 Because that's where the reward comes from. That's and where that's where comes. you have the ability to gather that energy to make it another day. Correct. Right. Right. In the hard world. Um, so I know we've kind of touched on this there. We know that there are going to be differences of opinions on a school board. We know that. Um how do you think it's best to address the differences in opinions? So uh, differences, I think differences are good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm going to say this is going to sound weird. I, I like conflict. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Yeah. Um, conflict usually implies that people care. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you didn't care, there would be no conflict. Right. right? So. When you're passionate about something and I'm passionate about something and we differ on the solution or even the problem mm-hmm. and we, we have conflict about that, then that's generally a good thing right. uh, as long as we come into that conflict with, in a position of humility and, and really want to listen and understand, not make a point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think I, I, I like that dialogue. I like the fact that people think differently. Um, I. I you know, my wife and I do some marriage counseling at the church every now and then. And, you know, we talk to couples and like, look, you guys are different by design. If you were the same, one of you wouldn't be necessary. Right. Right. <laughs> so and, and I believe that points of view are like that. If everybody believes like everybody else, then what's the point? Mm-hmm. So I think that's important. Um, we we do have a great opportunity this year. Um, there is a really, really good class of conservative school board members running in mm-hmm. several districts. Uh, and we have a really good opportunity to, to, to and, and I know these people personally, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're humble, they're, they're good folks, they're smart. Um, I, I would be honored to serve with all of them on the school board. Um, and if we're able to do that, I think the school board, what the school board can accomplish and what the school district can accomplish is without, without boundaries. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a fun four years. Absolutely. And something you would want to be a part Absolutely. of, right? And be proud to be a part of. Um, so speaking of differences in opinion, um, would you be able to support um, a vote that you did not, um, were in agreement with? No. Uh, if I don't agree with something, I'm going to vote against it. Mm-hmm. But I'm only one vote out of 11. Right. Right. So right. Um, it's it, it just kind of the way the, the system works. Mm-hmm. Um, I would make a pretty strong case as to why I would be in you know, opposition to a particular policy mm-hmm. before a vote um, in hopes that I can convince my other colleagues to see things my way. But at the end of the day, I'm just one vote. Mm-hmm. You are. But, but I, I, I always, I've said this, look, 
I'm going to be a staunch supporter mm -hmm. of the things that I believe in and that my my constituents elected me to support. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be I'm going to advocate for those things and I'm going to vote for those things and I'm going to support those things. Everything that's not there, I'm going to come against. Yeah. And and maybe that could be as simple as voting no, or it could be as, you know, I could take a mic and tell people why I think this is a bad idea. And hopefully other school board members will listen and vote no as well. So, but, but yeah, just one vote at the end of the day. It is. Um, what is your vision for education for our district and for our community? I think with our current spend, I think with the talent that we have in the school district, I think we could probably be a top 10 school district in the state wow. in the next four years. It's amazing. I, I really believe that. I don't think we could be number one in four years, right. but I think I think we could be top ten. I think we could be a top huge 10. improvement yeah. from where we are, um, and that looks like everybody getting on board, though, mm -hmm. right? Like I said, I think we have a lot of talent in the home office. We have a a, a lot of talent in in our schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, our teachers are fantastic. They have they a hard are. job, but they're really really good at what they do. Yeah. Um, it's just I'm, I'm just empowering them to you know take let them do what they need to do. Uh, and focusing on the right thing so that we can we can really, I, I keep saying it, but give the, our, our citizens of Hamilton County the school system that our kids deserve. Right. Public education today looks very different from when it did, uh, even when I was growing up. Right. Um, what do you feel like a major issue facing public education is? I think we've gotten away from the basics. I think, you know, public education, I don't, I mean, I'm a little older than you, so I, public education- <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, was really about reading, writing, and arithmetic, and mm -hmm. maybe some civics and some social studies in there, right? Yeah. Um, now we got all this social emotional learning going on, and I, I, I think we're spending a lot of time and effort and money on stuff that shouldn't be the school system's responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to get back to basics. We need to get back to teaching our kids how to read, how to write, how to do arithmetic, teach them civics, teach them local Tennessee history, teach them national history, show them what a wonderful country we live in, not, not erase all the bad stuff we've done because we've made our mistakes. And, you mm -hmm. know, people always say if you ignore history, you're destined to repeat right, it. Right, right. Um, but but teach them all the great things. We're still we're still the greatest country that ever existed. We need to teach our kids why that is, mm -hmm. and and hopefully that'll make a difference. So, but yeah, I I think going, getting back to the basics is is really what we need to focus on. That's why I keep I keep touting academic development. Yeah. So that's that's what I think we should be focused on. Yeah. And I think school districts that do focus on those things do better. So how do you how do you plan to implement that piece? How do you get us back on just the, the core four? So to sponsoring policies that do that okay. um, and, and making sure that policies are written in a way that they have to be enforced. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's, 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 I'm limited to policy at that point. Right. There's there's um, and then, you know, the school board still has the power of the purse. They can tell the school, the school, school superintendent, no, you can't spend money on that. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the really the, the only two things we can do. Absolutely. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that you've combed through the thirty five hundred <laughs> line Liner. budget. Yeah. Um, as a board member, what would you choose to cut back? Where would you choose um, to cut I, back? I think so. We did a all the social emotional learning stuff. Mm -hmm. I think we could probably reallocate some of those dollars and do more with them. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a big fan of the social emotional and academic development coaches. Mm -hmm. The the whole seed coaches. Um, the fact that academics is third on that list troubles me. Mm -hmm. um, these these people that are in these schools have the ability to talk to your children and they don't have the responsibility to disclose those conversations. They can tell your children anything mm -hmm. and they don't have to tell you what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I think we're we're disintermediating parents from their from their children's education and, and, and that's wrong. We can't do that. So yeah, if I were gonna cut anywhere it'd probably be there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that there there isn't a need for for helping some students and stuff like that, but but these seed coaches make you know a third more than teachers make. Yeah. 
and there's two of them per school, hmm. right? And then the, the whole department that's over social emotional learning and all right. that stuff, it's, it's, it's an expensive part of our budget. So yeah, that's probably somewhere where I think we can sharpen our pencil a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. As you look at the budget, where would your priority be? Academic development, classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. That's where the priority should be. Are you wanting to increase the teacher pay? If they, if warranted, yes. Mm -hmm. If good teachers should be paid more. Yeah. Absolutely, and we should have more of them. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. So we, we uh, I, I think we, the, the superintendent did a 5% pay raise for all teachers last year or this mm -hmm. year. Um, but a lot of that was eaten up by inflation and a lot right. of that. So uh, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but teachers are forced to pay into the county pension fund, uh, which right. I think is 10% um, off the top. Mm -hmm. So that 5% turns into 2.5% pretty quickly, mm -hmm. right? Just just because you have to donate to the pension fund. So um, I'm not saying that it was not the right thing to do. It, it is, but, but we should be able to do that. more yeah. because that we're losing teachers to, to Georgia because yeah. Georgia pays slightly more than, than Hamilton County does. Uh, Georgia's benefits aren't as good as Hamilton County's mm -hmm. benefits. Hamilton County's benefits, a lot of teachers go there and don't realize that until later. But right. um, so our, 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 our benefits for teachers are really good. Um, but I think, I think we can pay them more. I think we need more of them. I, I think 3,000 teachers for 45,000 kids is not enough. No, not at all, especially when you have support staff. An another 3,000 people Even support. more, yeah, yeah, that's wild to me. Um, I do want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, I want to know, what is your opinion on technology in the classroom? So are you talking about social media and telephones and all that stuff? Yes, just in, in the, yeah. Okay. Chromebooks, all of it. Well, I, I think there, I, we need to divorce a couple of things. Sure. So I, I don't want to conflate two things. So I think, I think social media in the classroom, I think that stuff has no place in the classroom. Um, it, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't ignore the fact that the world is becoming more technological. Right. And children need to be proficient on how to use computers and how mm -hmm. to use and how to do that. Um, they're going to be using computers in, in the regular world, right? right? I mean, yeah. even carpenters now have to program CNC machines. Right. Right. And, right. Pilots need to know how to run computers. And the military is all computer-based now. So we have, to, we have to teach these kids how to use computers. We have to, they have to become proficient with them. Mm -hmm. But we also have to be able to shield them from the negative side of that. And there's plenty of time for them to be exposed to that when they get, right. out, of, when they get out of school. They don't need to be exposed to that in school. Yeah. So, and there's, there's, there's ways to do it. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, when I was in the corporate world, we had firewalls and we had stuff that kept us from going to places and mm -hmm. our, on our phones that they didn't want us going while we were in the building. Right. And so that, that stuff can be done. It's pretty easy to do. And we have an electronic policy, uh, electronic mm -hmm. device policy in the district. Not all, believe it or not, not all principals adhere to it because the policy mm -hmm. doesn't have any teeth. So certain principals mm -hmm. feel like it's in their best interest to ignore the electronic device policy and they have administrative liberty to do that. So when I when I get cut on the school board, make sure the policies we write don't have the ability to be circumvented by you know, whoever wants to. <laughs> whoever wants to. Yeah. Policies are policies for a reason. We, as you are aware, I mean, I've got it. My youngest is in fourth grade. And um, last year was the first real year he had of school with the pandemic. Um, how do you plan to motivate students and families Af that have overcome the pandemic um, in light of the falling scores, how the higher truancy uh, rates and the struggling students. Yeah, so I, I think I think we lied to our kids during the pandemic, right? We told them we told them it was okay not to go to school, mm -hmm. and we told them it was okay if they weren't performing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I get why we did all that, right? But it, but at the end of the day, that's the message they got. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take us time to and and it. It, it stunted their emotional development of people, right. people. And we're just now starting to see that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to get kids back in school and mm -hmm. helping them understand that, hey, you got you to gotta be there. You right. got to do that. And listen, it's no different than the corporate world, right? After, after the pandemic, we wanted to bring employees back into the workplace and we met a lot of resistance. They're like, why? I've been working yep. from home for two years. Why do I need to go back to work? Yep. Well, because we need you back to work. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, but yeah, it's, it's, um, 
I think we just need to, we need to, school needs to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, we need to develop community for kids in school so that they want to be in school. Yes. So one of the things that we, we, um, we measured was employee satisfaction when, mm -hmm. when I was in the, in the corporate world. And interestingly enough, there was a, there was a question in our employee satisfaction survey is, do you have a friend at work? Oh, wow. And, and the people that answered yes to that question usually scored higher in overall satisfaction. Of course. Because they had relationships inside the workplace. So I, I think we need to foster those relationships. I mean, when I was, um, some of my best friends when I was growing up were kids that I met at school. Right. Right. So that's why I think, I, I, I'm, I'm op I'm, I believe in school choice. Yeah. I really do. But I believe that children should primarily go to the school where they're bounded. Um, unless for some reason that school is just not meeting that student's need. And then that parent has the right to let that student go anywhere they need to. Right. But, but those relationships are really important. And if they can build relationships and they can, and they can have friends in school, then they'll want to go to school. Um, so and there needs to just be, we just need to make time for that and, and make that available to kids. Mm -hmm. Make sure they have those connections. Yeah. Um, and I agree with that as someone whose report card always said, she talks too much. Social butterfly. Mine too. I would agree. <laughs> Got to bring it back. <laughs> Did you hear that, Mom? There was something good that came out of it, right? This was a good part. <laughs> I, I frustrated my teachers because I'm really good at multitasking. So I'd be having a conversation while she was talking and she'd say, Eddie, what did I just say? And, and you I could repeat it, it and verbatim. I oh. repeat it verbatim and it just infuriate her. <laughs> of course. How dare you be able to do both? <laughs> I love that. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about how you're how you want to prepare the students, right, for success. Right. Um, can you elaborate on that even more, especially with kind of where our test scores are? I know sure. some of it is that resources, some of that is motivation, but So I, I think you're again I, do, I I make distinctions between what success looks like. For mm -hmm. some kids, success may be going on to college. For mm -hmm. some kids, success may be a career in the trade. To some kids, success may be starting their own business. Some kids success may be joining the military, right? right. So success has different faces. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody has to go to college, right? right? We, we've lost sight of that. We've created this stigma that if you don't go to college, somehow you're less than. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of money to be made in the trades. Yeah. There's a, I mean, you can make a great living in the trades. You know, Rebecca at Chattanooga mm -hmm. State talks about a living wage, right? right. Um, and, and that's important. So I think we, we need to understand what students' aspirations are. When I was a kid, we had guidance counselors, right? right? That they would, okay, what do you want to do, right? Do you want to go to college? Okay, what, where college do you want to go to? Do you want to join the military? Do you want to be a welder? Do you want to be a woodworker? Whatever that question is. And then they would, they would guide your curriculum based on kind of what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So my wife was a product of the vocational program. My wife ended up being a paralegal. And so she oh, worked wow. She worked as a legal secretary when she was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, so she went to school at the beginning of the day and in the second half of the day, she would go to work and she would get credit for that. Um, so there, there's, there's still things we can do for that. I think mm -hmm. removing the stigma of if you're not a, going to college, you're somehow dumb or less than. Um, I, in fact, I don't envy these kids that are going to college today. I mean, they're graduating from college, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars in debt in some cases, and they're walking out of college, you know, making 35, 40 thousand dollars a year. And as a business guy, the the cost benefit yep. on that doesn't seem doesn't. like it's right. Mm -mm. So, um, I I just I, I really do need to. I think we need to understand, use guidance counselors to understand kind of what kids want to do, okay. help guide them through that process in, in high school, and then help them to achieve kind of what their life's ambitions are, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, the Bible says, lead a child in the way he should go, and when he gets older, he won't veer from it. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out where they want to go. Let's yeah. let's lead them into kind of what their, what their bend is, and let's make sure they're capable of doing those things when they graduate from high school. Absolutely. And, and you know, having kids of your own, um, your kids will think you don't know anything because we don't, right? <laughs> Never a child. When, you, uh, <laughs> when they get older, you'll, you'll amazingly become more smart as your oh, kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, I became wise when my son turned 25. Okay. 
Well, I've got a little ways to go, right. but there's hope. But I was a I was a dummy until then. Of course. So I didn't know what I was Anything. doing. No, I was Anything. dumb. But when he turned 25, I got really smart. That's so great. It's funny, right? That is. But, it's yeah. amazing how that's shifts. <laughs> Um, but I do think that we need people outside of us. You need the leaders at church and you need the teachers and admin. And then you also need people in your community, which are a piece of that is guidance counselors to be able to say, okay, let's try to align your passion and to find your purpose, not just chase a paycheck. Correct. Right. Because we know it when, when you get to do something with, I get to do something every day that I love. Right. And I, it brings a joy that no amount of money on a paycheck will ever bring. Right. Right. And there's that satisfaction. And I, I feel like when we start, when you start chasing the paycheck and what that can give you or, hey, well, I can go to school for this many years to become this so that I can know. What do you like to do? What are you good at? Right. What were you made to do? What are you created? Right. right. And, and when we can help kids who still have so much going on in this world is throwing so many things faster at them than they can even catch up with, right? Um, I feel like they need that extra support. I, I agree with you. I, I think I think kids kids need to be, like, I had, I had a conversation with both my kids when they were yeah. juniors in high school. What are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Right? What do you want to do? Yeah. And my daughter says, I want to I want to go in the military. She went into wow. the Coast Guard, and she it's was amazing. in the Coast Guard for years. Um, and my my son was funny because he, he's like, um, well, I want to be a doctor. And I'm like, okay, well, that's going to be expensive, but yeah. <laughs> let's do it. So um, he got into Xavier, and uh, good for him. He uh, on a half scholarship. He did really, really that's well in amazing. high school. He in um, he gets to school the first day, and he's like, uh, comes home and he's angry. I'm like, what's the matter? He goes, this count- guidance counselor has screwed up my entire schedule. I'm like, what are you talking about? Okay. He's like, look at this. It's nothing but science and biology and da da da. I'm like, bro, that guidance counselor's got two jobs. Right. One is to get you admitted into medical school. Mm-hmm. And two is to get you graduated in four years. Mm-hmm. She's going to load you up. He goes, well, I don't want to be a doctor. I said, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to make movies. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> and he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, and he's a creative now. He worked in Atlanta on a couple it's movies. Fantastic. And so we sent him to film school and he did his thing. But yeah, he, he'd shifted and shifted mm-hmm. from doctor to I want to make movies. So big uh, shift, <laughs> big shift. Um, but and, and Danielle did really well in the Coast Guard. She got out. She's got a job d- doing logistics and she's doing all that. So, um, yeah, it's it, you, it, if they, they they'll figure it out. You just yeah. got to you just got to give them kind of the leeway to help them figure that out. And sometimes you got to say, hey, you sure. Right. you sure you want to do that. Do you really know what this means? Yeah. And then they'll think about it and go, oh, I didn't think about that. Mm-hmm. And so, but yeah. Because that's our role and that's what we should be doing. And But I also feel like giving those that have been put in leadership roles above our children is huge too, right? And to make sure they're the yeah, right really. people. Right. That are, that being, are investing. That are mm-hmm. investing and, for, and that they're there for the right reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what issues do you think, Ed, the district needs to address in what we offer academically through programs and, um, and yeah, just the offerings that we do have? So I, I think the, the whole... Um, English as a second language thing, I, I think is really big. We, we have a lot of people moving into the district. Look, I, I'm I'm a son of Cuban immigrants. I learned mm-hmm. to speak English. English is my second language, believe mm-hmm. it or not. Um, I learned to speak English in elementary school. Right. So I know how important those programs are. We, we need to do a better job with that. We need to get kids up to speed on English as quickly as possible so we can integrate them into the classroom. Uh, I think that's, that's becoming a, a, a bigger and bigger need. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, literacy, we're so far behind on literacy. I mean, we have the state law that says kids have to be at grade level by the third grade. They're going to be held back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know that that sounds harsh, but I think we're doing them a disservice if they're not. Right. Um, so we need we need to help them get to literacy. Lit- I think teaching children how to read mm-hmm. is the greatest gift we can give them. If they learn how to read, mm-hmm. they can learn anything. Right. Right anything right. so there's a lot of power there isn't yeah there? yeah there's nothing they can't accomplish if they learn how to read mm. i mean they're just they're bound by their own by their own ambition at that point absolutely so that's what i believe okay so yeah i think i think we need to teach kids english um and, and to help them assimilate into the culture right again my parents are immigrants we we assume my parents became american citizens i jo- i i served my country in the marine corps right we assimilated into the country right. so we need to help these kids that are coming from other places assimilate into our culture mm-hmm. so that they can 
you know, have the same love and, and respect for what we have in America that, you know, what, what, why their parents brought them here. Right. It's great. Um, what are your thoughts on programs for, um, for children with special education? I know we talked about the IEPs, mm-hmm. 7,000, um, but, or the English language learners, um, or even gifted students, all which fall into right. that IEP. So I, I think we, I mean, with 7,000 IEPs in a school system with 45,000 kids, I, I, that just seems like a big number to me. Um, one thing I've heard consistently is we're not adhering to them. So we're not. We, we, whether we just don't have the staff or mm-hmm. the IEPs are too ambitious or we just simply have too many of them. I, I don't know what the real problem is. I'd have to dig into that a mm-hmm. little bit more. Um, but yeah, if kids needs have special needs, whether whether they're you know learning disabled or they're excelling or wh- whatever those things are, there are on an individual education plan. Um, if we put them on one, we need to adhere to it, right? right? We, that's the least we can do at that point, right? So um, if we have too many IEPs, and we probably need to have that conversation and figure out why that mm-hmm. is. If, if we don't have enough people supporting them, then we need to figure out how to fix that. Right. So, and again, maybe we need to cut in some places so that we can give these kids the, the right opportunities. Mm-hmm. How would you advise um, a parent who may be listening or watching today um, whose child does have an IEP and it's not being honored, which is obviously a disservice to their child. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how would you advise them to ask for help or kind of what would the first steps be for them? So the first steps obviously are to speak with the school administrators, the principal, the teachers and all that stuff and see if they can get to a resolution. Mm-hmm. Um, the next step would go to the home office and mm-hmm. speak to the person in charge of the acceptable education program. Okay. Um, and then eventually a superintendent. And then if they still have no joy, then they have the ability to go to their school board representative or the chairman of the school board and talk to them about it. Um, but ultimately with the voucher program that the governor is is, is touting, they can vote with their feet. Mm. They can use their tax dollars and put their children in a place that gives them the education they need. Yeah. And I'm a big proponent of the voucher program. I think, I think competition does two things. It, it improves quality and lowers cost. Mm-hmm. Um, so if these public schools need to compete, then I think they will do better. Yeah. In fact, the data reflects that. So the Cascade okay. Institute did a study. Cascade Institute's out of Portland, Oregon, which mm-hmm. is not a conservative bastion by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination. But they did a study. They looked at um, they looked at school districts where there were um, educational savings accounts mm-hmm. all the way back to 2001. Really? And in almost every case, except I think two, the performance of the public education system improved as a result of vouchers. Mm. They had to compete, so they had to improve. Right. Man, and that's, that, that's I think. Real, that's real data, right. decades worth of data. Right, I think definitely a change of perspective, right? Right. Because um, I think for a lot of people, it's just, it's very new. And I think it may be so new that we're just not, I say we, because I'm part of this community, are not understanding it. Um, because you get pieces of it, right? Right. And everybody's got, you know, some people say, well, you're you're going to gut the public education system by doing that, or you're, or, you know, you're only benefiting people that are wealthy. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think that that's true at all. In fact, I, I think the, the voucher program is more is more geared to low income people that mm-hmm. can afford educational children or choices for their children, right? And that empowers them to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think if the school system's not meeting your needs, then you should have the right to take your tax dollars put them in there. and put them somewhere else. Mm-hmm. It's not the school's money. Right. It's the taxpayer's money. Right. People lose sight of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, sure. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of Governor Lee's plan. I, I think I think we need to do more. Of, there's a there's a there's a tightrope, though, because we need to make sure that schools that where you can use these vouchers are held to some level of some standard, right? Right. Some educational right. standard. Um, and I think there's rightfully some concerns that the state or the or the or the federal government will come in and say you've got to teach this particular thing in this particular way, which would kind of you know circumvent the whole voucher mm-hmm. program itself. But I, I think we need to give parents data and mm-hmm. if they choose to take their child to another school, we need to make sure that they have what they need to make an educated decision whether that school is really going to meet their child's needs. Right. But at least we're putting that back in their hands at Correct. this point. Yeah. Um, I'm all about empowering parents to do mm-hmm. the right thing for their kids. Yeah, because nobody knows their kids better than them, Correct. right? 
So that's a huge thing. Um, I want to switch back just to teachers for a moment um, because they're also a huge part, right, of why our children are growing and learning. Right. Um, how do you plan to ensure that teachers are prepared and supported and encouraged from the top down? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't understand how they wouldn't be. I mean, they're the front they're the front mm-hmm. lines, right? That's that's what we're all here for. Right. Um, so, mm-hmm. first of all, we need to be really clear on what the expectations are for teachers. Mm-hmm. We just need to be really clear on what those are. If you don't know what the expectations are, it's impossible to meet them. Right. So as long as we understand what the expect understand what the expectations are, then we need to make sure that the school district, the home mm-hmm. office develops a culture of supporting them. So I, I, I know it's, it's, it's a com- almost a, a talking point at this, but serving leadership is a really big thing to me. Mm. So in serving leadership turns the, the leadership model kind of on its head. And serving leadership, where, where the traditional leadership model says, you're my employee, you're here to support me and do what I ask you to do. Mm. Servant leadership says, you're my employee, I'm here to support you and make sure that you have what you need to get your job done. Wow. So that's, I'm a big proponent of that. And I think we need to instill that culture into our school district. I, 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 I don't know if it's there or not. I haven't talked to a lot of people with the district, but, mm-hmm. but, it, but I think if we develop that and we develop a culture where everybody realizes that they're in a support role for those frontline teachers and their job is to support them and to empower them and to enable them to do their job better, I think teachers will be a lot more satisfied with their career choice. I think you're right because they need that, right? Yeah. They need that. Um, if you are elected, how would you prefer the community to, to communicate with you and contact you? Um, so I, I have a cell phone. It's always on. Okay. <laughs> um, I know that's dangerous, but it is. Um, email, text, uh, social media. Anything. Whatever is best for them. Yeah. I'm not going to be arrogant to, tell, to dictate how they want to communicate with me. If they want to communicate with me any way they want to communicate with me, it's my duty to listen. And what would you say the time frame that they could, I know it will depend on, yeah. there, there could be other factors, but what would an ideal but time frame be? If I'm getting 40,000 emails a day, it's going to be hard. But um, I, I think hearing back from me in a day or two is not unreasonable. Okay. That's awesome. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask you... A tough question. It may not be tough for you at all. You're probably prepared for this. Um, why should you be elected? Um, again, I think I think I have a unique capability of understanding problems and coming up with mm-hmm. solutions, and having the ability to negotiate and use resp- use my relationships to be able to motivate people to. Okay do things that are going to improve our community. Um, like I said, I, I have I have the education, the, 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 the experience, the training, and the time, and I've got a plan. I mean, I, I know, and, and my plan wasn't just like formulated out of the air. My plan was based on talking to hundreds of people. I'm like, what does the school system need? Um, and people are terrified that we're going to raise taxes when we don't need to. We just need to optimize our resources. People are People are upset that they're not being heard. We need to engage the community. Mm-hmm. And people are frightened for their children. We need to secure our schools. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what we need to do. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think I should be elected. That's why I'm still in the race. And hopefully if your audience will agree with me and yeah. early voting is ongoing. You goes through uh, the 27th and then the, early, the uh, primary is on the 5th. That's fantastic. I am... Um, kind of wanted just to hear you say it again. I think it's neat. And those for thank you to those who were able to join us live today. But um, I love that. Not only do you know what you're talking about, or you put on a really good show. uh, But to hear you consistently saying the same things is important. We need to know that you are firm on your stance that you this isn't just like you woke up and you're like, I'm doing it. No, like this was thought out. Um, it's not just because you're retired and have time. No, yeah. there, there's a need, there's motivation, and, and you do. You have done the work. It is thorough. Um, and as you said, it's it's the reallocation of funds. This is not anything else that needs to happen. And I've done it in two months. Wow. I, I, I Seriously, wow. We, we decided to run in, in January. Mm. So that's how much time I've spent on this. I spent 
days on the budget. I've spent yeah. days talking to other administrators, understanding what they're, I've knocked on countless doors. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's the work ethic I want to bring to the office. I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. It's, it's not like I have 10 years behind me learning right. these things. I've learned this stuff in two months. I have so much more to learn. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that's the work ethic I bring. And the passion, yeah. right? You're obviously very passionate about this, which is as a parent in this district is very encouraging for me um, uh, as I, my necklace, so it's all anyone's gonna hear <laughs> this laughing, but, um, but I think that's great. Thank you so much for taking Thank the time. I appreciate yeah. it. It's been a pleasure meeting you. You as well. I feel like we're gonna be real fast friends. I, I think so too. It's gonna happen, that's awesome. And it would not be Heather's most precious if we did not ask, um, what does Ed Garcia find most precious? Hmm, my wife. That's a good answer. She's, uh, <laughs> she's, she's the reason I'm here. She's, uh, she's amazing. We've been married 34 years. Wow. And um, yeah, Mary's, Mary's my rock. So, yeah. I love that, I love that. Well, we are hoping for a big win <laughs> from you. both you and Mary. Appreciate that. Thank you for the servant heart that you have and, and for wanting to help our students succeed and teachers, all everybody, right, succeed to make us better. So. And if anybody wants to learn more about me or the what we're doing, just go to voteedgarcia.com. Okay. Um, and you can you can get involved in the campaign if you choose to do that, and or you can Fantastic. just find out more about me and my my three step plan. Okay, and that will also link to any social medias that you may have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're primarily on Facebook. Okay. Um, um, once we get through the primary, I think we'll be doing a little bit more on Instagram. Okay. Um, I, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn uh, with my professional stuff, but perfect. But mostly we're doing everything on Facebook right now, and hopefully we'll expand to link uh, to Instagram here shortly. Okay. That sounds perfect. Well, y'all heard how to be able to find Ed Garcia and how to show your support. Um, thank y'all for joining us for this episode of Heather's Most Precious. And as always, I hope that you will choose to be kind, choose to be grateful, and choose to encourage. And we will see you next week for another episode. Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. Heather's Most Precious is brought to you with love by the Hendrickson Agency, an insurance agency serving all of Georgia and Tennessee. The Hendrickson Agency, properly protecting your most precious possessions. Support for Heather's Most Precious is provided by Study.com, which offers SAT and ACT study materials and even has resources for AP and college credit courses. Listeners of Heather's Most Precious get 30% off their first three months of any subscription level with offer code PRECIOUS. Just go to Study.com and use offer code PRECIOUS at checkout. Heather's Most Precious is produced by Chattanooga Podcast Studios and is part of the Podnooga Network. Find out more at ChattanoogaPodcastStudios.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Heather's Most Precious.